Well, I think neonics may well be going. I think there is every chance that the decision will be taken in, the, in Europe to not use them. It won't be the same in the rest of the world. So we will have to have alternatives. At the moment, that will be the chemistry we already have, and that will be severely jeopardised by resistance issues. But I think going forward, things that we work on here, alternatives, whether that's crop margins, bringing in beneficials, whether it's trying to make plants more resilient by breeding or GM or any of the other techniques, that's all coming, but it's very slow. And I don't think we should rule out chemistry because even if we accept that neonics might be doing some harm, there is huge potential now to design very selective chemistry. And that's an area I think that we should be looking into more. I think it's really hard to do that research now. I think if, if we thought about this uh, previously, it would have been potentially easier. Now it would be really hard to find the right sort of areas of land on the right scale to test with and without neonicotinoids. I mean, we can do it on small scales, but then you're always trying to extrapolate to the bigger picture, and that's very difficult to do. So to do it on a scale that's relevant at population level is very time consuming, very costly, and, and would be really hard to, to get, I think, definitive data. I think it's actually a hard task to do that. So having criticised the fact that we don't have data, it would be difficult to get those data. Lots of people have said to me, why on earth did you do it? But if we don't, then science won't get taken into the equation. And people who are lobbying, people who often don't know much about a topic, are often very vociferous and they make statements and if scientists don't react and don't try and put science across, however hard that is, then the science will not be part of the debate and that's a real shame because it ought to be science driven. To some extent, yes. I think lobby groups got onto it very early. Um, I think there, there was an agenda. I think pesticides broadly were, were an agenda but neonics became the agenda. And I think it was quite hard for scientists to, to come into that debate because there's always subtleties. No scientist is going to say neonics aren't doing any harm, which would have been the simple message. But to try and say, well, they might be doing something, but they're not the only thing you should be thinking about and they're not the only causal effect, that's a very subtle. And I think that's a hard argument to put across. So there's obviously a lot of research goes on in companies because they're in the business of, of making a pesticide that works and it's not in their interest to make a pesticide that harms non-targets. So they do a lot of work on specificity and, and, and that's often data that are internal to companies. It's not always published. I think the work we do with companies where we insist it has to be published is, is more in that area in between where we're trying to work at a level where we understand, for instance, how bees metabolise pesticide and we, we want to publish that, and that's important data. Rothamsted itself probably would struggle to fund a lot of this research if we didn't work with companies, but equally we work with all other sorts of sponsors and funders. And so we try to work with all partners and to try and get a consensus view, but that isn't always easy to do.